Your Creative Push, Episode 114. Did I do the thing I was supposed to do today, the small little step towards a larger goal? Suddenly, you can really see yourself making progress. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Jane Radstrom. Jane is a figurative painter from San Francisco, California. She is known for her unique pastel portraits of people depicted with multiple poses layered over one another so that they appear to be moving. Jane's work is shown in galleries across America, and she has won awards from the Portrait Society, the Pastel Society of West Coast, and Pastel Journal Magazine. And I guess, actually, (laughs) before we get into this, we should... Uh, make an addendum because it won't be San Francisco for long, right? Right. Yeah. I'm moving to Berlin in about a month. So in July. That is so awesome. So thank you so much for, you know, taking time to come on the show because I know how crazy it is to move, especially to move out of the country. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Well, can, can you tell us a little bit about your art, kind of artistic history and, and how you got to the point that you're at today in your career? Yeah. So uh, thank you for the great intro. I was thinking I would try to describe my work, but I think you did a great job kind of painting a picture of it for anybody who hasn't seen it before. But um, yeah, I'm a painter full time. So I work out of my studio every day doing work that shows in galleries. And my paintings are fairly realistic, although I consider them contemporary realism because I'm not going for a straight traditional academic approach. And I show the work in galleries, as you said. So people always ask me when I tell them I do realism, they say like, oh, is that portrait commissions? But I more so paint people and then put the work in galleries. And then the people who buy it don't know the person in the painting. So <laughs> that's how it goes. Very cool. But yeah, it is very realistic. And I can't believe like on Facebook, you'll you'll post, you know, what you did that day and, you know, the picture of the portrait that you made uh, alongside the, the actual person. And sometimes you can't even tell the difference. It's you have an insane talent and you can output work very quickly. Has it always been that quick for you and that um, easy, like only a few hours and, and you have a completed portrait? Oh, I guess that I really like to try to work fast because if I slow down too much, then I'll chase unnecessary details and Mm. working quickly helps me try to go for feeling or mood instead of pure accuracy. It tends to be that the faster I can do something, the better the final result is. And then my pieces, which are not so good, take me a few weeks (laughs) because there's a lot of struggle instead of just really getting to the essence of it right away. That's really interesting. And that's such a a good point, too, because sometimes we just spend too much time um, trying to be a perfectionist or or trying to figure out all the the details that don't need to be figured out um, beforehand in our heads. So I like that idea of, you know, just pumping it out. (laughs) Yeah, Kind of going along with that, I know that you like to put your models in um, unique positions. Can you talk a little bit about why that's important to you? Yeah, so working with models uh, to do the double exposure pieces specifically, how I do that is I have a model come over and I ask them to do actions over and over again while I shoot photos. And the action part of it, it kind of makes them more candid because they get bored with like, putting on and taking off a sock for the 20th time. (laughs) And so the first time they do it, maybe they're like really kind of sucking it in and posing for Mm -hmm. the camera. And then the 10th time, they're just kind of behaving more naturally and forgetting about the camera to some degree. And uh, having them do the action allows me to shoot thousands of photos and there's small differences between each pose. And then that's how I can find the ones to layer together for the movement effect. Very interesting. Well, and kind of a weird question, but do you find that you, you enjoy photography as well, like that, that portion of it? And do you find that you've kind of developed a talent for photography as well? You know, that's an interesting thing because when I first started out, I was really terrible with the photography part. And that meant that I had to fill in decisions Mm. for the painting and fix things. And then as I got better at the photography, 
then I could get to something I really liked in the photo stage. But that meant that maybe I had already created the art and executing the pastel became just a copy of something I had already created. And it was sort of less interesting that way. So I'm actually trying to kind of refine that process again, because I want my photographs to not be quite so good. <laughs> or <laughs> I don't, not that they're amazing. They're not yeah. great photos. But just I, I need to have like creativity when I'm actually executing the art piece, where I'm changing things and editing things and not just trying to replicate uh, photographs. So I'm trying to kind of bring around my reference again in a different way to allow me to do that. Really interesting. That's a that's an interesting struggle to have, I guess. But that's cool. Yeah, thanks. Oh, yeah. So w- when you started this double exposure technique, and for, for people who haven't checked it out, uh, head to yourcreativepush.com slash Jane. W- when you started this double exposure thing w- with the layers on top of each other and, and kind of mimicking uh, movement, I guess, what was that like? When did you, was there like a moment where that, where you just decided to, to start doing that? Oh, yeah. Actually, that was right after I had gotten into my first gallery and given them a bunch of work, which wasn't double exposure, and they were selling it pretty well and asking me for more work. And I just didn't have really new photographs to work from. I had one photo shoot that I had hired a model for, and I had painted all the interesting things from it, but I needed some new work to give them. So I was kind of looking through it again, and I thought, well, this pose is kind of similar to something I've already done, but maybe I can combine it with another pose I like in order to have it be new, just something different. So at first, it was really just kind of stretching myself to use my material, my photo reference in an interesting way to produce something new, and then also just to see if I could do it, like if I could achieve the effect and make something interesting out of it. So it was almost like developing the style was almost like by accident? Yeah, it was almost by accident. And then as I started to do them, I started to think of different things that I could do that would make them more interesting. So now I really look for a different mood in the poses that I choose so that other than just movement, it kind of shows like an introverted moment and an extroverted moment. Hmm. Those are my favorite juxtapositions so that you see like two different sides of a person their personality in the in the poses that I choose. So it's come to be more intentional. And, you know, I'm more interested in being uh, very intentional about what I create with it. But in the beginning, it was just kind of uh, an accident, like you said. Very cool. Yeah. And like you said, once you, you know, start developing the, this new style and this new you know, form of, of art almost, then you start looking for it and then you kind of get deep into it where it's, you're always looking for, for that, that thing. Was there any type of, um, like fear or like, um, hesitancy to kind of move on to this, this new thing? Like, as you said, you're having a lot of success with just, I, I don't know what you would call them, just straight up, <laughs> straight up portraiture. Was there any kind of hesitancy to, to, to move on to something new? Yeah. Well, I think that for me, the difficulty that I've always had is I want my work to be like important, especially uh, about eight years ago when I first got out of college. I thought, oh, now I'm not a student anymore and I'm not doing exercises and classwork. I'm, you know, suddenly I'm a real professional artist in the world. So my work needs to be important. It needs to like express something necessary to society and be original and reference art history, but without repeating it, you know, really Mm. a lot of pressure to achieve all those things, you know, at 20 something right out of school. And so I still think that those things are really important, but I've had to give up on thinking I will achieve them maybe ever in my life, (laughs) but certainly like right now. So I have to just kind of produce work and um, get the work out so that uh, instead of waiting for genius or waiting for this perfect, fully formed idea, I've found that it's more important for me to just do work, develop the idea as I produce work, and then hopefully bring it towards something which at least is important to me personally, some idea or expression which I feel I can stand behind, uh, but maybe it's not like 
contributing to the continuity of art history <laughs> quite yet. Yeah. No, I hear what you're saying. And I think a lot of people uh, have that same feeling and put that same kind of pressure on themselves, which is <laughs> totally unfair to do to yourself. But I think that, um, by the way, I, I do think that you are contributing in, in that manner. Um, you've said you want your art to, to respond to the, the time that you live. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I just think that in terms of uh, being a traditional or a realist painter, you know, my background, I studied at an atelier before college, which is a very traditional studio school, drawing and painting from life. And I love that kind of work. But I sort of feel that that kind of work, it feels a little bit rooted in another time, uh, you know, an older time. And I'm very interested in kind of responding to the stimulus that's around me right now and having aesthetic which draws from the aesthetic of the current age which is kind of how the double exposure comes into effect because you see a lot of that effect used in tv promos used in like title sequences for movies mm. um you know with photoshop and photo editing it's something that really anybody can kind of do with their photos recently. So it's very much in the zeitgeist. And I think hmm. combining that um, aesthetic, you know, from contemporary culture with the fine art traditional aspect makes it something that is rooted in this time using the skills from a traditional training. Absolutely. And I, I love how you found that kind of on your own, too. I, I agree with you that it's really important to push forward almost um, and, and to develop your skills and to, and to do something new or something rooted in, in current time. I think a lot of times people uh, w with any kind of art, it's a lot of um, not copying, but it's a lot of emulating like your favorite artists and the people that inspire you. But I think that it's really important to, to add your own spin to it. And if it's something, if it's a spin that, that can be something new, I think that's really important to, to push art forward. And then you are doing your job as you were talking about before of, you know, the continuity of, of art as a whole. Yeah, well, I have kind of a formula that I always encourage my students to think about not just being inspired by their genre, like painters or illustrators, uh, but to also find some other genres of art that really they appreciate and can inspire them. Maybe it's cinematic directing or a color palette from pop culture somewhere, color palettes from graphic design or something, uh, if you can pull from something which wouldn't necessarily be directly associated with your genre and then combine a little bit of that into what you do, then I think it creates a mix which can be more original as opposed to only trying to mix different painting influences to come up with something new. I love that formula. I love that strategy because, yeah, if you if you're taking it from something else and and putting it into something that it's not usually used in, um, it's still familiar to other people, so that there's still some kind of recognition there. But you can also push things forward and, and do something new. I love it. Yeah. Are there some things that initially held you back uh, from doing art uh, in earlier in your career or when you first started out? And do you have any of those still? Those resistances? Yeah. Well, I think that. Even though I've, I've tried to let go of the idea of doing this important work, I still kind of tend to not want to commit myself to a new direction until I feel like it's going to be successful, which I think is actually the wrong way to go about things. You have to try it out first and try to refine it, and then that's how you find something successful. But if you try to work it all out in your head, before ever doing any painting, then it just sort of never comes together. So it's a balance always because I want the paintings that I do, I want to ship them to my galleries and I have deadlines and shows, but I have to also have some time and permission to fail and experiment in order to push in a new direction uh, and not expect that every single piece is going to be gallery ready and completely awesome you know, with that room for failure in there. Absolutely. I think a lot of people struggle with that, that paralysis by analysis, where you're just, you, you think about it too much and you have to plan it out too much in your head that you never actually do the work. And sometimes if, if you do, it's something completely different and maybe not as, um, 
not as unique and not as authentic as it would have been if you had just started once the idea kind of came in your head. So I love that idea. What's your best advice for, for getting past that paralysis? Um, I think you just have to kind of set a schedule and make yourself work every day. Uh, even if you're not inspired or you don't feel like you have any ideas that are good enough, <laughs> you just have to go to the studio and produce something because I found that basically I don't know how to get inspiration from the outside world. I just, I don't really get inspired. The longer I wait, the less inspired I am to paint. And it just kind of like, you know, momentum goes in the wrong direction. <laughs> True. Slower and slower. Whereas the more I paint, the more inspired I am and the more ideas I have. So just getting that momentum going in the painting direction by working even on like exercises, just sketches or, you know, direct paintings from life or something that's not very creative, it still pushes that momentum in the right direction. So then I start the ball rolling towards painting a lot and feeling more inspired. Absolutely. It's just sitting down and starting. And then, as you said, once you're smack dab in the middle of it is when these cr crazy new ideas come to you, but you, you have to do the work of putting yourself in the chair or, or standing if you stand <laughs> yeah, and just, and just doing it. Yeah, exactly. Do you have like a, a worst moment or a hardest time, uh, specifically having to do with, uh, your creativity and, and some of the things that hold you back? Yeah, I, I can tell you about, uh, when I was around two years out of college, I had sort of given up on the idea that I was going to be able to make these important paintings that I wanted, but I was just trying to make like sellable work, trying to get into some galleries and get my career started. And I had gotten this advice from some of the instructors that it's hard to sell figurative paintings. And if I want to kind of break in, I should do like still lives and landscapes because they're just easier to sell and get into galleries with. And so I was trying to paint still lives and landscapes, which I'm not really very interested in, to be honest. Mm. And so I wasn't painting very much at all. And the paintings I was doing were super boring, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. And they weren't selling and I wasn't like getting any notice from any galleries. And basically, I was just considering changing careers. I was thinking like, oh, wow maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I should go into marketing or be an art director or something that seems way easier. Right. <laughs> like having to figure out how to make a career at painting. And then right about at that time, I moved and I moved into a new studio space with some other artists around. I was teaching uh, just drawing, figure drawing part time. And that was kind of helping me pay the bills. So it started to turn around when I decided that if I wasn't selling any paintings anyways, I might as well just paint whatever I wanted and not worry about what was going to happen with them, like who I would sell them to. So then I started this series, which I call the girl series, uh, which are mm. these paintings that are kind of candid moments of women usually getting dressed or undressed. They're kind of intimate moments. Uh, and I had started working on that series and just producing a lot of them without any kind of pressure or expectation because I just figured that they were just for me. And then that's the work that actually started to get attention for me. Yeah, I think there's a lot of takeaways from that story. And the, the biggest one is do it for you. Do whatever it is as if it's not going to ever be sold and it's just for your own enjoyment because that that's the whole point. That being a professional artist is a hard path, I'm sure. But it makes it even harder when you're doing stuff that you don't like, like you said, like where your heart's not in it and when you're not even enjoying it. So I think that the big lesson there is just to, you know, whatever makes your heart sing, <laughs> not to sound too corny, but whatever, you know, whatever it is that makes you, you happiest, like to just tap into that, like that's the easiest sign is if it, if you enjoy doing it, just keep doing it. Yeah. And I think that when work has an authenticity that you're passionate about, and it speaks to something in your experience, that authenticity kind of rings for other people, then the work isn't hollow. And even though figures and especially like nude figures with recognizable faces are supposed to be just the hardest thing to sell. For me, when I did that work that I really loved, other people, I guess, could see that they could see what it was I was trying to portray. 
and they could respond to it and have an emotional connection to it also. So it worked out okay. Yeah, it's like ignore everybody, basically. <laughs> you know, just just don't, even if people are telling you what sells and what doesn't sell, usually that's not the the thing that you should be focusing on, even if that's what you are focusing on, even though, you know, if that's what you need to do to, to make a living and if you, if you want to have a, a an art career um, as a professional artist. But it's almost like just ignoring all of that advice and just, like you said, doing what you can put your soul into, what you can put your authentic self into. Yeah. Uh, on the flip side, do you have like a best moment or a most triumphant creative moment? Well, I guess that this is actually, this will be kind of the end of that previous story. But so I was living in Austin and I had done maybe 20 of this girl series uh, pastels and I would go to gallery openings every month and just kind of check out the scene. And finally, one month I was at this small new gallery, which showed kind of contemporary realism work. I was looking at the show and I just thought, you know, my work could hang here. My work could hang with this work. There's nothing, you know, preventing that. I should just email them. And so I updated my website, got my cover letter in order, and I sent that email. But because I had done all that work to prepare that email and the, the website, I thought, you know what, I'm also just going to email the best gallery in town. Why not? Worst thing that can happen is they'll say no, I would love to be in you know, the best gallery in town. So I'm just going to email both of these places. Um, and so I did. And within 24 hours, the gallery I really wanted to be in got back to me and said they wanted to see my work and then started showing it a few weeks later. Uh, so I felt like, wow, I waited too long. You know, I thought mm. I wasn't ready or that this work wasn't going to be sellable and I had just been holding it back and then as soon as I kind of put it out it really went somewhere yeah it's like what we were talking about before that the paralysis by analysis it's it works in that that manner too where you know you think that it's not the perfect time there's ne there's never going to be a perfect time and it can't hurt to to just reach out and ask whatever it is that you're doing like even me emailing you like I I saw that you were moving that you announced that you were moving I was like hey like I know it's probably not a good time, but do you want to maybe do an interview after? And you're like, no, no, like let's let's jump on now. You you can't assume what what other people's responses are going to be, you know? Yeah, yeah. Do you have a, a formula for balancing your time? Uh, well, that's become a little easier since I've been married because my husband works a regular uh, full time job, so I tend to work regular working hours, and then I can spend my evenings and my weekends with him. So usually when he goes to work in the morning, I do a, a casual commute to the coffee shop, which is just a way to make sure that I put on real clothes and speak to someone. <laughs> 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 so, you know, I just like walk a few blocks and I have a coffee and check my email for 30 minutes. And then I go home and get it get working in the studio until about the time that he comes home in the evening. Yeah, that can be a really important thing, too, is to, to just get out of the house and, and just start that routine that way. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think for freelancers or people who work from home, it's always it can be a little bit lonely or a little bit isolating to just be by yourself all the time. So, yeah, absolutely. And it's really hard to be your own boss, too, in that manner. So uh, to, to shake it up and just get out of the house so you're not like constantly isolated, like you like you said, can sometimes be amazing. And just getting out of the house and taking a walk too is just super important. Yeah. What would you say that your art and creativity uh, brings to your life? You know, I'm a very pragmatic person, I guess. So when I think of, of that, I think that the hardest thing I can think of doing, <laughs> like I really can't think of something else that would be more challenging than being a professional artist because of it's hard to make a living. It's hard to sell work. It's hard to promote yourself. But also, especially the hardest thing is just dealing with all of the internal emotional stuff about uh, inspiration about your ego and feelings about your work, about what sold and what didn't sell and how to not pay too much attention to that and keep progressing as an artist and allow yourself to fail and, 
You know, it's just <laughs> like, it's really the hardest thing I can think of. So I guess that what it brings to my life is a lot of challenge that uh, keeps me really engaged in what I do every day. Absolutely. And it's really important as a human being to challenge yourself and to not, you know, fall into this, uh, the easiest path, you know, the path that gets you from point A to point B, where point A is like <laughs> starting a job and point B is like retiring and like nothing in between, you know, what what's the point? What's the point of doing it if, it, if it's not challenging? Do you think that you would be able to that you would have had a, f- a fulfilling life doing anything else? Uh, you know, when I'm feeling really discouraged, I kind of fantasize about if I had just been like an art director or something, and then every job would have clear criteria and I mm-hmm. could do those criteria and then the client would be so happy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, And that would be like, and I would just feel like, oh, I, I did a great job. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't always get to feel like I did a great job in the studio any given day or week. I don't know, though. I mean, I didn't choose that path. And I, I don't know if I would actually be happy or not, you know? <laughs> yeah, I hear you. And yeah, but it's it's like a double-edged sword where you have the freedom uh, every day to to. Ex- be creative and express yourself and do new things. But at the same time, there's no guarantee. It's not like you can clock in and clock out and follow the lesson plan and, and, you know, the day is over, but that's the the challenge, I guess, that you put yourself through, but it's that much more rewarding when, when it does uh, work out successfully. Yeah. Do you have a, a favorite book or YouTube clip or anything else that really inspires you and that maybe could inspire us as well? So actually, I would say the most inspiring book that I go to all the time would be just a sketchbook. I usually Mm. carry a sketchbook with me in my purse everywhere. And I really like the handbook journal brand because they come in small sizes and they're cloth bound and they just feel a little bit fancy. But the sizes and paper are a little better for me than moleskins. Uh, So I carry that with me. And usually if I've been Um, like on vacation, and I'm kind of easing my way back into the studio, then I'll start sketching a lot, you know, drawing for an hour at the coffee shop in the morning, um, drawing my husband at dinner to get myself back into it. So I really recommend a sketchbook. And then also another thing that I use to kind of warm up, or if I'm not feeling very inspired, and I'm not sure what to do in the studio, I'll use the New Masters Academy figure drawing YouTube sessions, which are just 30 minutes of poses, photographs on YouTube. They each have a timer, so they start off at like 30 seconds and they get longer up to five minutes. And one session is 30 minutes long, but you kind of just click play and then you can draw from those photos as a way to warm up or just to get your day going. Very cool. And we'll have those linked in the show notes page again at yourcreativepush.com slash Jane. Jane, it is time for the final push. And this is where I ask you to reach to the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today. That's thinking, you know, maybe I could do this too, or maybe I need to get back to work and just give them your best words of advice and really push them to pursue their creative passions. Okay. So I think the first thing is to set a clear goal So to really ask yourself, what am I trying to achieve? And then why do I want that? You know, so you can focus on the outcome of what's going to be good when you actually get there to achieve that result. And uh, I know when you first start with a personal trainer, they always ask you, like, what's your commitment level from one to 10? So then you can be really honest with yourself about how much you want this thing that you're trying to go for. Uh, So I think if you can set yourself a clear goal, then break it down into a little to-do list of what you need to do on a daily basis to achieve that goal. And it can seem really abstract to think like, oh, I want to get better at drawing. I want to draw people better. But if you break that down and you say, what do I need to do every day in order to achieve drawing people better? And then you can check off even on a calendar you know, did I do the thing I was supposed to do today, the small little step towards a larger goal, then suddenly you can really see yourself making progress and you can track whether you're 
achieving what you want to achieve by breaking it down into those little steps. So I would say set a clear goal and make a to-do list where you break that goal down into something you can do every day or every time you have time set aside in order to be making progress towards that goal. I love that strategy because it it breaks it up and it makes this big, you know, big task not seem as Herculean. But it's yeah, it's all. I would also tack on uh, the advice to to make sure you take the time to step back and uh, admire your own progress and to congratulate yourself, you know, and to really real take in how how far you're you're progressing in this this goal that you set for yourself because. When you're in it uh, on a day to day basis, it it just you know you're in the middle of the path, and it doesn't feel like it's like a very long path. But if you can step back and look to see how far you've come, yeah, that's very very important. Yeah, that's good advice too. Jane, thank you so much for coming on the show today and for for giving us that push. Thank you, young men. Of course, uh, and you can find Jane on her website at janeradstrom.com. That's Jane, R A D S T R O M. Uh, and on Facebook, she is Jane Radstrom Art. And on Twitter and Instagram, she is at Jane Radstrom. Jane, thanks again. Thank you. I love it. This was great for me because I've been admiring Jane as an artist for a really long time now. And there was a lot to learn in this episode, but I think one of the most important lessons is Jane's best moment. You know, just emailing somebody and seeing what happens. You know that the world provides, you know, harsh critics in general, but why put yourself in front of them as an initial critic? Why make their job easier by providing a buffer uh, beforehand with your own judgment on your own work? And of course, if you really know that you need to do work, then you need to do work, but you got to be willing to lift that buffer quickly and start putting yourself out there as early as you can, even earlier, most likely than, than you actually should, because all they can do is say no. And that's what you're already saying in your own head. But if you've already created the thing, you've already gone through all of your own resistances, um, of, of just creating the work. You know, you've already gone through that entire process. You're on the other side of, of creating these fine pieces that you want to make. You've already gone through your own resistances and the next step's easy. It's just (laughs) really, honestly, it's a few simple keystrokes. And I know (laughs) that they are some scary keystrokes, but if, if you want your art to hang somewhere, if you want whatever it is that you do to show up there, if you want to be promoted in any way, if you want to be appreciated in any way, you're going to have to compose that email or whatever is comparable to creating the email. You're going to have to reach out to someone. You're going to have to put yourself out there. You're going to have to push your art, your creativity out there in some way. So just do it now. You know, you can do it again in a year like you've already been planning in reality, more like two years. Am I right? <laughs> you know, but just send it now. And who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe you don't have to freak out about it for this long. Maybe you can just send that email tomorrow or even better today. Maybe you can just type up that email, send it off and just be like, Oh my God, I can't believe I just sent that. Do that. Put yourself in that scenario where you're just like, Oh my God, I can't believe I just put myself out there like that. I think that's what you have to do start that journey. Maybe they say no, and probably they'll say no, but so what? You know, that's what you figured. That's what you figured they're going to say. But guess what? Even then you've still won because you've done something that so many people never do. And you've put your name out there as well, even if it's just in the form of an email. And if they say no, you've also learned it stings for like just a moment, like to get stung by this wasp of rejection. And you've gone and you've kicked the nest and you've come away almost completely unscathed and you're just now so much more savvy than you were before. And guess what? You can try again and again until someone gets what you're putting out there because sometimes that's all you need is just that one person to get what you're saying uh, and open the door for you. But they're not going to open the door unless you knock. You got to put yourself out there. 
And while you're waiting for that door to open, like Jane was saying, just keep working. Just keep putting in the work. And like her, just keep outputting without thinking too much. Folks, we will be here for you on Friday if you need the push again. An awesome episode with Zoe Williams. But until then, hopefully you're inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done and do all the extra steps that you need to do to promote yourself, to put yourself out there. I love you all, and we will see you in a couple days. Have a good one, everybody.